It is 7.03, so I'm going to get this started. Um, for everyone, um, my name is Adele Alamo. I'm the digital organizer here at Dogwood Alliance. And um, Dogwood Alliance is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. For over 25 years, Dogwood Alliance has fought threats to our forests and frontline communities. We promote forest protection as the best solution to climate change. We partner with communities to develop economic solutions that work with and for our forests. Our mission is to advance environmental justice and climate action by mobilizing diverse voices to protect Southern forests and communities from industrial logging. Um, I am very proud to announce our host for the evening who is Erniko Brown. She is the uh, Director of Organizing and Partnership Engagement at Dogwood Alliance, and I'm going to hand it off to her. Thank you, Adele. Um, good evening to everyone who has decided to join us today. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to have with us our presenter for this evening. Um, we've really been working on the issue of biomass here at Dogwood Alliance, and oftentimes people um, talk about they don't understand what biomass is and if you don't know what biomass is then how can you stop something that you don't know about and so uh, Miss Kathy Eglin is one of our partners um, as we do this fight she works diligently in the Gulf South but what we wanted to do this evening was to make sure on this day Earth Day 2022 that we gave an understanding of what biomass is and how it um, impacts our health uh, and how it relates to climate justice. So without further ado, we have here with us, Ms. Kathy Eglin. Ms. Kathy Eglin. Hi, thank you so much, Anika. And happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you all for joining, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to com commemorate uh, this very important day. And I'm going to open this up uh, with the, uh, a photo, if you see there, that is the first Earth Day that was held in 1970 in New York, and that's on Fifth Avenue, which they had to close because of the crowd. So um, we're celebrating 52 years today of Earth Day. <laughs> So, and I, I want to say that this is an occasion for where we celebrate our earth, but we want to be able to protect our earth. So it is an occasion where we honor earth, but it's also an occasion and it's very important that we talk about the preservation of our earth and the st stabilization of our climate. And we have to, it's so important that we talk about um, great solutions, that we talk about, um, and I don't even like to use the word false solutions because they're not solutions at all. Uh, they're deceptive practices and some of them are just downright hoax, hoaxes. So, um, and one thing, you know, people are fooled by some of these so-called solutions uh, that are merely just deceptive schemes. So you can fool people, but you cannot fool Mother Earth. And let me say, uh, I know that a lot of people, as Anika said, um, have no idea. They've never heard of biomass uh, or wood pellets. And I can remember uh, speaking to a group, and at the end of the presentation, someone asked, what are wood pellets? <laughs> and so from that point on, I decided not to take for granted that people knew about wood pellets, that people um, knew about biomass. So I want to um, show you a little bit, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. And um, what I'd like to ask is that you will keep an open heart I want you to listen with open minds and open hearts. And I hope that you are motivated to reject this false, misleading climate hoax of wood biomass that ultimately amounts to putting profit over people. And I ask that you are motivated to reject the notion that wood pellets 
uh, energy is a viable, safer alternative to fossil fuel and understand that it is in fact an extremely harmful, toxic process that not only it destroys our invaluable forest, but further imperils vulnerable communities. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the good, the bad, and the downright ugly truth about biomassive hazards of biomass. So what are wood pellets and why should we be alarmed by this climate mess? Uh, if you look over in the corner, you'll see the logs and then you'll see those little pellets. Those are actually larger. Uh, they've been enlarged on the screen. They're much smaller. And what these are, they're cutting our forests, grinding them, and then shipping them across the ocean, um, mostly to countries in Europe, but now they're doubling capacity and they will be shipping these products. As a matter of fact, I was on the phone with someone from Japan and they're actually shipping our forests to Japan uh, and burning the forest, burning our forests uh, for energy. And why should you be concerned? Because our forests, you know, protect us. This is earth and our forests uh, protect us. And it's very important, even if you're not in an area um, that's using wood pellets or that's manufacturing wood pellets, your family, your friends, uh, someone, especially in the Southeast, someone that you know will be exposed to uh, wood pellets manufacturing. And it's important that we know about this because it's something that has to be stopped. So we need everyone not to be fooled by promises of temporary jobs because these industries are coming into our communities. They're making all of these promises, talking about uh, jobs. However, um, this is a very dangerous, toxic process. And I always say my mantra is a real living wage shouldn't kill or make people ill. We can have both good health and good, clean, safe jobs. Uh, these are temporary jobs because once the trees are gone, so are the jobs. And, and, and we don't need to allow people to talk us into sacrificing our health for someone else's wealth, because this is essentially what this industry does. Now, when we talk about, let's talk about the good and, and what nature gives us with trees. Um, you know, trees aren't just for beauty. We can use them for shade. They actually act as filter, uh, air filters. Um, trees are basically so good at, for our health. They're good for our lungs. Um, there are just so many things. Trees help us with flood control. They capture dangerous carbons from going into the air and, and disrupting our uh, atmosphere. And basically that is what is disrupting our climate. And, and no matter where you live, you're being impacted by climate change. Um, we keep talking about and hearing about the severe weather all of these severe climate events. And this is why it is so important to protect the natural resources such as our trees. And people are having trees cut and we're burning our forests for fuels when trees are so valuable. And, and we're basically just giving away nature's protection. <clears throat> so, when you look at, uh, and, and everyone was upset when a few years ago, um, we were talking about the rainforest burning in the Amazon. And that's because, and everyone was hearing the talk that um, the Amazon forest, those are the lungs of the earth. Trees are, they're basically our lungs and we got to save our lungs because trees protect us and it is so important. And, and one clear cut fact, because people are being told that you can replant a tree and, and this is renewable energy because trees will grow back. But replanting trees will not immediately 
replenish the, the value and the level of protection laws from cutting mature trees. We need to keep our mature trees. It's very, very important uh, to us. Excuse me. And, and, and trees also help to help our water, um, uh, help to clean our water. When you start clear cutting these trees, it contaminates the nearby water so sources and all of the connecting tributaries that these water sources in, enter into. So trees are so very, very important. I mean, they, they um, um, add oxygen, prevent flooding, they provide medicine, they provide fruit. There are just so many countless um, reasons for us to protect trees. And, and we need to celebrate trees. When we're celebrating the earth, we've got to celebrate our forests. We've got to celebrate our water supplies. Now let's talk a bit about the bad because this industry is bad. It is bad for our health. It is bad for our environment. It is bad for our climate. And, and, and is that me? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is there any way you can make it full screen? We're having a couple of requests if you can make the presentation full, full screen, screen so that it's that a little better? bit easier to read. Is that better? Um, <clears throat> that is actually cutting off the presentation in my view. If, if okay. you click on slideshow, it should okay. make it uh, full screen. Okay. Up at the top. Full screen. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then that's okay. Okay, because I, I, I know I'll that probably, we have gotten a couple messages. Okay, I'll probably let me try one thing here, and hope I don't cut us off. Um, and I apologize for, you know, jumping oh, in. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. setting your flow. Okay. Um. I'm trying now to get back um, to share my screen. Okay, uh, so that doesn't help. Is that didn't help at all? Actually, it's so if you if you see up at the top in the ribbon, it says um, from current slide. See, it says from beginning and then from current slide. I think mm -hmm. if you click there, that should go full screen. Is that there it? we go. Perfect. Okay. That's it. All Thank right. You, Good enough. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we're putting profits before people because we have these industries coming into our communities. They're getting huge government subsidies. Most of these industries, the largest one is foreign based. And all of our trees are now being cut and they're being shipped across the ocean as I mentioned earlier. And then they will come in and use the desperation of, of mostly the southeastern states, uh, but we have got to be on the lookout. We have got to be able to stand. We have got to be able to say that our health is not for sale. And it's very important uh, because communities want and, and need clean, safe, uh, and uh, economic development projects. We don't need any toxic harms. Now, the wood pellets manufacturing is a ha very harmful, uh, toxic process from the beginning to end. Uh, and these are the various stages of the processes. You start with the cutting of the trees, and then there's the shredding, and then there's the drying, and then there's the storage, and then there's the transport, and then there's the pressing. And one thing I did not put on here, and it's something that I actually experienced because I've had this slide for quite some time. And I personally experienced the loading when you're loading these pellets into trucks at the facilities. Um, and then the, they're, they're trucked to different ports and then they're shipped across the ocean, as I said. And then the final phase is where they are burned for energy. So, and we talked about um, the importance of trees. And as you see here, how a 30 year old tree will absorb 193 pounds of carbon per year. This is extremely important 
because CO2 is the cause, that's the major cause of the disruption of our climate that's been imperiling us with all of the, the frequent storms. So it's very, very important that we, you know, we prevent this. <clears throat> so during the shredding, drying, and storage process of wood pellets, just a dangerous process that can lead to all of these, you know, the headaches, the nausea, the dizziness, breath, breathlessness. You can even collapse and, and, and get unconscious. So what we're looking at when we start talking about these biomassive harmful, <clears throat> these toxins that are generated in the manufacturing process and, and what they cause these particulates or PM 2.5, the volatile organic compounds or VOCs, the nitrogen oxide, the carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide. And here are just a list of all of the health hazards that are posed in this manufacturing process. And I can tell you, I was doing an interview uh, in a trailer park where that's separated just by a chain link fence from one of the largest or from the largest uh, wood pellets uh, industry in the world. And I was just there for a few minutes and I became sick to my stomach. My eyes and nose watered and burned. And I was only there for a few minutes. Can you imagine what happens to people who are living there day in and day out? And Anika called to my attention because she had been there several times. She called to my attention that I was covered from head to toe in specks and debris from the wood pellets. And I came straight home and just disrobed and threw my clothing into the washer because I did not want to bring whatever it was into my home. But, I, you know, it's, it's also awful because you know that there are people who have to live there with all of this. And this is just a list of the things that can happen to you uh, with methanol that's um, not only highly toxic if you're breathing it, but it's also highly flammable. And um, I, I'll get to it later in the screen where there have been quite a few fires uh, from these plants as well. This is a little bit about formaldehyde, which is another um, toxin that is emitted during the manufacturing process. So let me say this, um, this in most countries, they're manufacturing here in the U.S. And I have asked a um, couple of our state, uh, uh, Nat, I'm sorry, a, a few of our U.S. senators and representatives, why are we allowing foreign-based countries to come into our country and expose us to things that would be illegal for them to do in their countries? And so this is just something that we should not be allowing. This is, again, just a list of some of the many, many health impacts uh, with people who are exposed to, to uh, biomass. Now, when you look at this, this is uh, at the beginning of COVID and they're still doing this. Another reason why it's so important for us to, well, we've been living with the pandemic for the past couple of years. And um, if you look, this is Mississippi. Uh, I, I don't know how many other states would publish uh, the underlying conditions or comorbidity factors associated um, with um, um, that, that contributed to COVID severity and COVID deaths. And they did this by race and ethnicity. And all of these are the majority, overwhelming majority of these conditions are all environmental related. So it impacts, it has a ripple effect where it also impacts um, your health and, and, and contributed to a lot of uh, COVID deaths and hospitali hospitalization and definitely uh, impacted uh, whether you were on, uh, had to be uh, placed on oxygen or intubated. So meet four of the primary offending industries as I like to call them. The villain number one is Drax whose main office is located in Selby, United Kingdom. And then they have other offices around the world. And then number two is in Viva, uh, which 
transports wood pellets from the southeast, uh, mostly the southeast. There are other states, but mostly the southeast, and they transport these facilities around the world. Uh, the, next, the third is pinnacle, and the fourth is German pellets. So this, these are the major companies who are destroying our forests uh, to ship these wood pellets to other countries to be burned. Now, there was a report, and I'm hoping if we have a link to that report that we can put it in the chat. There was this report that came out in 2017 uh, that did an investigation, um, and the report was Dirty Deception how the wood biomass industry skirts the Clean Air Act. And this report research was done by the Environmental Integrity Project, which is made up of former EPA enforcement officials. And um, this is a lot of the things that they determine about the plants uh, emitting illegal levels of pollution, having faulty permits, um, overall half the plants, fail to keep their emissions below the limit. Um, they know full well when they come in to your community that they will be emitting well above the, uh, the legal limit, um, that, uh, but they do it anyway. They lie on their application. To me, this should be a criminal offense. And more than half these uh, wood pellet mills that are exporting to Europe, um, they emit a total of over 16 tons of pollutants every year. And now they're planning on doubling that. So another key finding was about um, how these people are just emitting. They're, they're literally breaking the law and they're getting very low fines. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, th there isn't, uh, since our health is not for sale, um, these industries shouldn't be allowed to do this at all. Uh, other key finding of all of this on all of this, and the, once this is updated, it's going to be even more troubling once this is updated. So I'm hoping if you will just take the time to read some of the key finding, look in the various states at some of these uh, and some of these industries that have been uh, fined for some of the things that they've been doing. Now, we actually sent a letter to the Mississippi State Department of Environmental Quality back in 2019. And we talked to them and we questioned them because we had proof from the Environmental Integrity Project that they were, uh, that Drax in Amit County, Mississippi was emitting well beyond uh, their, um, their permitted limit. Um, and we were told by MDEQ that they were in discussion with Drax about their emissions. So it took 18 months and we didn't find out about it. And then we had to really uncover it to find out that Drax had been given a fine. And I'll talk a little bit more and put that in perspective. But the downright ugly truth is that these industries lie on the application. They know that they're going to be emitting far beyond the, the limit, uh, which would require them to have more protection in these communities. Uh, so they lie on the application. Um, basically, they are located in states who they feel have lax environmental standards. They also, these are, are they, locate these facilities, for the most part, uh, the overwhelming majority of them are located in low-income communities of color. And if you don't just catch them in the act, they will continue to lie and lie until you present proof that they are emitting beyond their um, uh, permitted levels. So in uh, 2019, Again, um, uh, represented by the Southern Environmental Law Center and the Environmental Integrity Project, Clean Air Carolina and Dockwood Alliance have done a lot of work in this area. Um, they have admirably taken the lead and um, this did result in um, um, a signed agreement with Inviva. 
so some other violations and fines in Georgia, there have been fines in Florida, at Rhode Island. However, um, none of these fines would be enough. So these are pictures that I took in Gloucester, Mississippi, which um, is one of the worst ever, one of the worst cases. This is where I became ill just within a few minutes of there, standing there without a mask. Uh, these are some of, this is the area. Um, this lady has suffered. She's lost her, her precious, uh, two of her um, animals or her precious children, uh, her puppies. Um, and just when I was driving into Gloucester, uh, this, this truck was right in front of us. And these are just some of the areas. This is the trail apart. Now, Gloucester was buying two and a half million dollars. So let's put that in perspective. That was for eight years of illegal levels of pollution. Drax earnings are about two and a half million dollars a day. So, you know, for any environmental oversight agency to pat themselves on the back and say, you know, we, we gave them the largest fine to date, I want you to understand that that's not even a slap on the wrist. I call it a corporate time out. Because, and, and the sad part about it is that the residents knew nothing about the fine. They knew nothing. They had no idea that they had been exposed to these, these illegal levels of pollution. And, and the reason that they're making these um, wood pellets is because it's supposed to be a solution for climate change because we are in a climate emergency and we know that we have to transition the energy, transition our energy use. And so I think it probably started out, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna give people the benefit of the doubt. We're so desperate to have a viable energy alternative that we kind of bought into the desperation that we need to get our climate to the, we need to curb global warming down below 1.5 C. And so we started out with this admirable intent and, and we, we got into this and it is not. And then we found out that it's even worse than the energy source that we're using now. Uh, and that's the fossil fuel. So this is what I call liar, liar, plants on fire because these plants, because I talked about how combustible this is. These are the fires, just some of the fires that they have had uh, in different parts uh, around the country uh, during, at, at, at these plants. So um, the, it is very, I mean, the potential there if you're living in this community. And when I think about visiting that trailer park in Gloucester, Mississippi, you know, if that plant, if, if something happens and there's an explosion, I just fear for, for those residents and, and what could happen to them because it, it's like a tinderbox. So in our NAACP Just Energy Policies and Practices, um, it states that African-Americans are more likely to live near biomass production plants and suffer increased exposure to a number of dangerous emissions such as smog, asbestos, sulfur dioxide, and all the other toxins that I've mentioned earlier. So the NAACP actually passed a resolution and this resolution is being used around the world to dissuade countries from using um, uh, wood pellets uh, in, uh, energy. So I want you to look here uh, at some of the protections. And this is what these companies are, are doing um, because I, it's very easy. They will talk a good game, only none of it is true. Um, they will come into states and say that they're going to be a low source emission. This is to skirt provisions of the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air, under the provisions of the Clean Air Act, if you're going to be emitting over 250 tons of annual emissions, you get additional EPA oversight. Um, you will um, be required to have an environmental impact study. Uh, and that's 
for more protection to see how it's going to um, uh, impact your community, both positive and negative. So it will also require uh, compliance with regulations under the Clean Air Act. And you will also be required to uh, install the best available control technology. And even though these industries are getting billions of dollars, you know, they care so little about communities that they will just try and get around doing this. So after this company in Mississippi will, was fine, um, then they said they then now they have to do all of this. They 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 are now what they should have been to begin with. And and again, this was not from the diligence of our state regulatory agency that this fine came about or that, you know, because these agencies mostly self-monitor, they self-report, and then they give estimates. Um, so it was, again, through the testing of another organization, not our state, that, that this was discovered. And let me let you know as well, the largest wood pellets manufacturing plant is being built in Lucille, Mississippi. It should be up and running um, within the next couple of months. And that plant um, was permitted as a low source emitter, even though it is, you know, the largest in the world. So we know right off the bat that that's not true. Uh, again, this is just from Dogwood, how in Vivo, which is the second largest uh, wood pellet producer, have demonstrated that they you just have to catch them in the act and drag them to court before they will do the right thing. But they are continued to make promises. Um, they're good also. The public relations machine, they are very good about coming in, making jobs promises, helping with... Um, say, uh, any disaster assistance. Um, they will come in and pretend like they're doing things and, and, and they'll do, you know, give a little money, you know. And, and I know when you're desperate, uh, a little money seems like a lot, but when you're looking at your health and the welfare of your family, um, you know, it's not you know, it should not be for sale. We should not have a price tag on that. So if you look here at um, the states, and I always let people know, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. If you look here at the former cotton trade state and compare that map with the wood pellet trade state, they're almost identical maps. And I, I do this, especially when talking with people in the UK, because the cotton trade fueled the UK's industrial revolution, and and they turn their they turn their back uh, on the fact that the cotton trade was fueled by slavery, and now I'm we have to call them out on this. Um, they cannot turn their back on the fact that the wood pellet trade is on the backs of the most climate vulnerable states. The states, again, let me look at this. The states with the highest, if you look at these maps again, these are also the states with the highest percentage of African-American population. And, um, and if you'll look at some of the demographics of where these states are located in the communities that they're located, they're taking advantage of everyone's desperation. They're taking advantage of the need for economic infusion. And we know that people, we know that there is a need to put food on the table. But I always tell people, I know that you wanna put food on your family's table, but not at the expense of digging their graves at the same time. And, and a lot of times we can only see the desperation and we know we need to put food on the table today. We know that we need a roof over our family's head, but we don't need to do it at the expense of their lives. So, and I, I put this in here, beware of corporate hypocrisy, because again, these companies, these industries will come into communities, 
Um, and then they will do a few good things um, on the surface. Uh, and, and it probably looks as if they're really, really concerned about your community. Um, they're even being awarded for, for some of this. Uh, and a lot of times, a lot of people really don't know. They are not able to weigh the harm that they're doing versus the little good that they're doing. Um, because these people, like I said, are getting massive profits, profits, um, but they're also doing tremendous damage to our communities, to our earth, to our climate, to our atmosphere. And this is something that we cannot allow. So on Earth Day today, I'm asking that we reject this climate hoax because it's not helping us. It, we need a just energy transition, not just a transition. And that is exactly what this is. We're just transitioning from one harmful energy source to another. And it is very important that we have clean, safe, carbon-free renewable energy. And this is not carbon. This is, you know, now you'll hear, and I have to now say carbon-free renewable energy because for a long time we were saying we need renewable energy. And so they got around that and saying, well, you know, it's renewable because we can replant trees. Trees will grow back. But again, they will not grow back at the rate that we need them to grow back. Time is not on our side. We're in a climate crisis today. Uh, we only, I mean, we, this is a crisis and we have to address it now before it's too late. We're already seeing the impact. So I don't know how anyone cannot be paying attention to climate change because we are witnessing it every day. And it's up to us, it is up to us to make a difference. So as we celebrate our earth, let's keep in mind that we have a moral obligation to protect our earth. We have a moral obligation to preserve our planet and its people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kathy, um, for joining us. Um, and I asked people to pop uh, questions in the chat. And let me see if I see any questions right now. We have one question of, about what are some solutions and what can people do? Solutions. Well, we know that the safest solution is um, wind and solar. Those are renewable energy sources. Um, we have now, uh, most states are looking into, as a matter of fact, even in Mississippi, uh, as with other states, we're looking into solar and wind policies. Um, and, and these are actually energy sources um, that just like any other technology, they're actually within the financial reach. You can actually have solar. I am a proud solar user. <laughs> I had solar installed in my home uh, a year ago and I have, I'm saving money and I'm saving the planet. I, I look at my energy bills and I'm in disbelief uh, because my energy bills are so low and I also have that added satisfaction. So look at your policies as far as clean, safe, carbon neutral or carbon free renewable energy. Um, that's one thing. Um, look into using that, but also um, people just don't know. And I realize people don't know. People who do a lot of climate work with me, um, trying to around the world, um, just are not familiar with the harms uh, posed. So I know that most people, and I've been in this work for about since Hurricane Katrina, um, and so I know that if I'm talking to other people who have also been in this work, I know that most people, like even the people in Gloucester, just have no idea. They have this plan out. They have no idea 
what's going on. So it's a whole education campaign. And that's why I thought we thought it was so important to educate people on Earth Day about solutions to protect that Earth. And I'll jump in to say one other thing folks can do. So right now there's a small town um, in, in Southern Georgia called Adel, and they are fighting to stop a wood pellet plant. In fact, it will be the second wood pellet plant in their very small town. Um, and there's a comment period open with the Georgia EPD. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that action into our chat. And that's something you can do right now to help the folks of Adel. Now that you've learned about biomass, please reach out to the Georgia EPD and let them know that you do not want this plant to come to Adel, Georgia. It will be the largest biomass wood pellet plant in Georgia. It'll be the second largest in the country. And it's going to cut about 32,000 acres of forests every year in South Georgia and North Florida. So I'm going to do that right now. And would you drop in the link uh, from the NAACP? Because we, we stand by our policy. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of time industries can go in and they can convince people that they are the good guys in all of this. Um, we want jobs for people. There are clean, safe jobs. Uh, the NAACP is all about a just transition. We're all about having people to work. We're all about economic prosperity, but not at the expense of our health and welfare. Because if you don't have your health, uh, you know, what, as I said, what good is a living wage if it kills? So another thing is these, because they have been so successful here in the US, because we've been basically quiet about this. Um, I get frustrated with uh, a lot of people. I get frustrated with seasoned climate activists because they will not prioritize this issue uh, at the level that it should be uh, as it relates to policy. And I do a lot of work on the international level and that's an entirely different discussion about when you start talking about carbon tradings between countries. And I think that this is where these advocates can come in and really put people first and, and, and not when you're talking about policy, you have got to put people at the front of any policy discussion, how policies impact people. So that's one frustration. And then the fact that a lot of people simply don't know. And it's very complicated. I do understand that. I always try to break it down and simplify it. So I hope that people understand at least a little more about this than they did before they tune in today. But it is very important. It's, now they're talking about fueling flights uh, with wood pellets, which is so irresponsible because this is temporary. Once our trees are gone, and, and this is the thing, the UK, they're using our forests. <laughs> We're allowing them to come here and take our forests. They're keeping their forests. Um, so, so that should tell us a lot. And I've, I've posed this question and I, I encourage everyone ask, you know, ask our, uh, ask your, ask, ask your congressman, why are we allowing this in our country? Uh, why are we allowing to me, if you're, and I'm going to tell you just how I feel about this, you might as well be putting a knee to the necks of these community residents because you're slowly choking the lives out of these communities when you're putting these plants in, in these communities. Once the trees are gone, they're gone. The jobs are gone. Our protection is gone. Uh, we, we don't have 30, 40, 50, 60 years for trees to grow back. We're in this emergency now. We got another good question. Um, somebody says, D D Donna Selquist asked, do these companies cut in our state and national forests or do they have their own tree plantations? 
It's different. Um, each day's different. A lot of these, um, a lot of the, a lot of them use uh, private uh, forests uh, that sell their goods uh, for next to nothing. Uh, believe it or not, they're they're really underselling their goods. Now, <clears throat> let me say there's a lot of concern. Foresters should be able to sell their forests. Uh, 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 let me say, they should be able to make a profit from their forest. But our suggestion is, if you need, if you need funding for your forest, that the government should fund because they are providing protection, a natural protection for, for us. And there was a time when the government had a program where they would pay foresters to keep their trees. And if necessary, Rather than giving sub subsidies to cut our forests, to destroy our forests, we should be giving subsidies to foresters to maintain their forests. Because if we gave them those subsidies, if they had a choice between maintaining the forest and having them cut and, 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 and manufactured and shipped across the ocean to be burned, I'm sure that they would take the option to maintain the forest. And then we have another question about, do you think that these negative community impacts will create resistance to efforts for future climate adaptation work where community involvement is critical? And that is a question from Daniel Bell Morin. Absolutely, absolutely. It will um, um, definitely possibly um, create some resistance to, to these efforts. Um, and it's very important, you know, I always say that we have to look at four different areas. We've got to look at adaptation, mitigation, uh, resilience, and sustainability. Uh, all four of those areas are very important when you're looking at climate change and how, and how we're going to be able to address the climate crisis. But you know we've got to protect our forests. We have to protect our water sources because also now keep in mind trees are also they act as dams and they 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 protect communities from flooding. So that's another issue. And you notice we're already having record levels of flooding. And so what are we going to do? That's going to, we've got the sea level rise is coming about because of climate change. So now you're going to take away another natural protection. So we have Earth's protection uh, with trees. And, and what are we doing? We're destroying that. And, and it's just something we should not be doing. And also we, we will have, um, there'll be some actions, um, Anika, I'm sure, uh, as it relates to, <laughs> you know, uh, during the civil rights movement, I know that we were marching in the streets for, for our rights um, and we, we have environmental rights and we might have to take to the streets again in support of some of these communities because, you know, um, they're not just hurting, when they hurt one of us, they are hurting all of us. So it's very important. Um, and the, the processes that they go through, all of the, this is so secreted. Um, where even where they ship the wood pellets, these industries are so shielded and, and, and they're so, there's no transparency whatsoever. And so trying to get information from them, like even what we had to do to uncover the two and a half million dollar fines, I really think that we need to change some of the laws. People need to, when, you, when you've been poisoned, when you've been exposed to illegal levels of pollution, at the very least, you have you should have a right to know that. Absolutely. Amen to that, Ms. Inkman. Um, somebody asks, how do we find the NAACP ECJ resolutions? Um, is there a link in the chat? Um, I can find the link. <laughs> Well, uh, we, I'm happy to follow up. Um, that question was posted by Jacqueline Clark. I did post the biomass resolution, uh, the wood pellet resolution that was issued by the 
by, by the NAACP, but I'm not sure if Jacqueline is asking about a, a specific. Oh, she wants resolution. all the ECJ. It's at NAACP.org. Okay, great. Yes, it's at, um, um, on there. It's it's on that website. Um, and I will say that there are town hall meetings, um, not only here, we're having this one on Earth Day, but I've actually done town hall meetings in the UK and and throughout countries in, in Europe. Uh, virtual, um, the NAACP um, is a part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, that meets on a different continent every year. Uh, this past year, we were in, in the UK, in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, so any opportunity that we get because global warming is a global issue and it's not anything that we can address right here in the US. So we do have a seat at the negotiation table. Um, and this year, again, uh, we will be represented not only, and I, and, and I know we have NAACP on here, but there are two other organizations that are very important, very dear um, and near to my heart, and that's the Chisholm Legacy Project and ECHO, which is Education, Economics, Environmental, Climate, and Health Organization. Um, and that's a Gulf regional-based organization because of the disproportionate climate impacts uh, that we um, um, that 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 we are exposed to. Um, for the past couple of years, there have been so many storms that they had to go into the Greek alphabets. We lost count. We lost counts of the time that we've been asked to evacuate. Um, so I always say, as Fannie Lou Hamer would say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And um, we, we have to stop this. So I think everybody, especially here in the Southeast, but in other parts of the country as well, because when all of this is happening, whether it's the wildfires, the flooding, the severe cold, because people look at Jackson, Mississippi and the things people never thought would happen in Texas and Jackson, Mississippi, uh, with weather so cold, look at what has happened to them. So it may be Jackson or Baton Rouge or Texas today, but it may be your city or state tomorrow if we don't put it in, because climate change is not going to say, well, I'm going to skip over um, um, the Dakotas, or I'm going to skip over, you know, whatever state, or I'm going to skip over Arkansas, or I'm going to skip, skip over Oklahoma. You know, we are all at risk. Absolutely. And I just dropped the link to um, to ECO in the chat as well. So that if folks would like to check out information about ECO, they can. And the um, Chisholm Legacy Project, if you can find that, Adele. <laughs> okay, I will look for that okay. right now. Good. We are definitely appreciative of everybody joining us today. We are so grateful to have Miss Kathy as a partner here at Dogwood Alliance simply because she's been on the front lines for many of the things that are going on, many of the things that are happening. And as she stated, she's been doing this work since Hurricane Katrina started. She's actually a survivor and um, it has led us to doing this environmental work. She is one of our absolutely amazing partners doing the work. And I'm so glad that she stands on the front lines with myself and Dogwood doing this work. Um, and she'll continue to be on the front lines with us. Um, tonight was just a sample. We actually have an entire series on biomass coming up and it's called the May Day Biomass Series. So starting in May, kicking it off, uh, we'll be right back here via Zoom uh, talking about what is biomass because it takes more than one time to educate an individual on what something is. And so we're going to have a lot of community forums every week uh, with the exception of the last week uh, where we will observe Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we will have something going on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Central uh, Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will be right here talking about biomass we will actually um, have an opportunity to talk with people from Mississippi. So we will talk with 
community members while screening a documentary that we did about the right to breathe uh, there in Gloucester, Mississippi. We are super excited uh, to reveal this to everyone this evening. These amazing faces that you see, you will see in action once again in less than two weeks and we are super excited. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we will send this out with a recording. A recording will be sent out um, with this, but we definitely look forward to seeing each and every last one of you with us again uh, and kicking it off. Ms. Kathy will be with us again, educating everybody about what biomass is Thursday night, May 5th, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the same time, see us in a little while. Thank you all. Y'all have a great night.